Okay. So um, our X-ray tube. Let's look at what it's made out of. So um, we'll start with the source of electrons. Okay. So we call the the side of the X-ray tube that has a source of electrons. We call it the cathode. The cathode is on the negative side of the X-ray tube. X-ray tubes could be called a diode tube because they only allow electricity to travel in one direction, from negative to positive. We call most X-ray tubes a dual focus tube because as you'll notice in this picture, there are two filaments. Only one is used at a time. Okay, so the filament is that little, um, let's get these guys here. These filaments are coils of wire, like the filament wires that you see inside of a light bulb, an incandescent light bulb, which don't even really get used nowadays, but hopefully you remember them, okay? The filament wire is like that, okay? Well, thank you. All right, cool. So cathode, right? Dual focus, you can use one or the other. Now, why would you use one versus the other? There's really good reasons for this. Um, the larger filament can handle more electrons moving through it. So with a bigger exposure, an exposure you wanted to make more x-rays with, the larger filament is better, okay? So why even have a small filament, right? Because I can run less electrons through this, but the other thing to consider is um, the size of the source of electrons changes your image properties. This is not something we'll directly get to today, but um, a larger source of electrons gives you um, less detail in your image, okay? Let me, um, <laughs> let me give this by way of analogy, okay? Um, look, so the ceiling lights are spread all across the room, right? So look down at the floor and notice like a shadow of something, okay? A shadow of the table, shadow of the chair, shadow of your arm or whatever. Do you have a very clear shadow? No. Why is the shadow blurry, not clear? Multiple, uh, sources of light, right? If this were just one source of light, it would be a big source of light, right? There's light coming from on that side of the room, coming this way, right? There's light coming from that side of the room, going that way. There's also light on this side of the room, going that way and this way, right? Casting multiple shadows of the same object, giving you blurred edges to the object. It's as if we had many flashlights creating bunch of shadows of one object, right? The image we see is blurry on the ground. If I wanted to make a clear shadow, like uh, like uh, Michael's doing a good job right now, he's holding his hand over the table, looking at the shadow of his hand, and he notices the shadow of his hand is blurred. There's multiple projections of the shadow of his hand. You guys can all do this if you like. Multiple projections of the shadow of your hand. If you wanted to have a clear shadow, how many lights would you use? Just one, right? And the smaller that source of light is, the clearer your shadow will be, okay? In x-ray terminology, we refer to the source of the x-rays as the focal spot, okay? A large filament creates on the anode disc where the x-rays come from, a large focal spot, okay? A large area where the x-rays originate from. That's like all of the lights in this room, okay? The small filament makes a small patch on the anode where the x-rays come from, equivalent to a small flashlight. You'll notice that your, your shadow of your hand is blurry with the, all the lights on in the room, and it'd be a lot clearer if you just held one flashlight over it, right? The, in the same way, but less dramatically, detail on our images will change when we move from small filament to large filament. Okay, and it just has to do with the size of the area that the x-rays are coming from is either bigger or smaller with the use of the small or large filament. So you consider two things. You consider how much detail you want, and you, can, you need to consider how many x-rays you're producing. Okay. Now what's nice is, uh, one second. what's nice is the equipment will, does a pretty good job of selecting the right one of these for you but you can override the equipment and select one or the other, okay? Um, did you, you have a question? Yeah, so um, I know you haven't talked about this yet, okay. but when, when it focuses the electrons coming out of it, I mean, obviously these are in, the two, in two separate positions. Mm -hmm. um, does the machine sensor the filament? Um, no. Or they just stay exactly like the that filament stationary. Moment? No, the filament stationary. So, you know, one filament's here, the other filament's here. They're slightly separated in space, but they hit the same spot on the anode disc. Where the electrons would strike this anode disc would be the same spot, even though 
One's here and one's here. So are they kind of like curved, pointing in the same direction? Yeah, they're focused. Angle, they're angled. They're, they're, yeah, we can we can say they're pretty safely. And it, it would be a tiny amount. You're talking about a distance of one inch from there oh, to here, right? I, I see it now because there's uh, there's like more space in the middle. Yes. As opposed to the, the you notice that you notice they're also angled like that yeah. too. They're not parallel. That's because they're they're um, trying to line it up with the with the radius of the disc. Um, yeah, so there's a small angle to them and a, a small apparent angle in, in a couple of different um, dimensions, but less important, it's really good that you see that though. Um, but yeah, so that's the, that's the idea, is that um, this filament, hang on, let's zoom in here, this filament, if I can get it to center up, has, um, this, this cathode has two filaments. Right? We call it a dual focus tube. Your machine can access one or the other, or you can tell it to access one or the other. And it may choose to prevent you from accessing one if you try to enter the wrong set of factors. Right? You tell it to, you know, I want to run high kilo voltage and high milliamperage, and I want to use the small focal spot. The machine might not let you do that. Right? So it's really um, nice. The engineers have made it so that we can't hurt the equipment. Um, very easily. We have to try really hard to damage our equipment. Um, and that's because we want them to last a long time. The, uh, the filament wire, we want it to be made of something really strong and tough, so we made it, make it out of tungsten. Okay. What do most of you know tungsten from? Where, where do you experience, what's your experience with tungsten? Wedding rings, wedding bands usually, right? They're great. Tungsten wedding bands are, are nice because um, they're cheap. They look nice, right? Um, usually they're used for men's wedding bands, right? Um, but tungsten's just a really strong metal. Okay, it has a high atomic number, it's very dense and very strong. It has a really high melting point too, so it can get really, really hot before it melts, which is nice because we're creating you know, something close to 4,000 degrees at the filament, so we want our filaments not to melt when we make our first exposures. They can retain a lot of heat, they can heat up a lot, they can retain the heat, and they can cool down without warping and a bunch of bad things happening. So tungsten's a good material for that. The focusing cup around it is made of a combination of molybdenum and nickel. Nickel melts at really low temperatures, so they have to combine it with something that's really, really dense like molybdenum. Probably never heard of molybdenum, it's really only used in, in this kind of stuff. Um, but a combination, an alloy of those metals will be what your focusing cup is made of. Okay, um, good. Let's move forward, uh, there's more to learn. The, now we're looking at the cathode like from the side and looking at the anode disc is on the left side, cathode's on the right side. What we want you to notice here is that the cathode, um, we call it a focusing cup. You notice from the previous picture the filaments were kind of recessed into that um, uh, cathode face. Well, um, the, fil the cathode face, the focusing cup kind of wraps around the filaments on, on a couple, on three sides and open on the front. And um, there is a, an electric charge ran through the cathode focusing cups. The whole metal cathode that holds the filaments has a negative electric charge applied to it. You know by now that um, like charges repel each other, right? So the negatively charged cloud of electrons is repelled by the negatively charged focusing cup and it's and it is the beam of electrons is focused because the filament is recessed into that cup and all sides of that cup are pushing on that beam of electrons that cloud of electrons focusing it down into this narrow beam which then strikes on the left side of the image the anode um, face The focal spot, which is, so to be clear, the focal spot is where the electrons strike the anode face. When you had this in your hand, hopefully you took some time to notice, the face of the anode was angled a little bit, right? There's an angle to the anode face. Um, and this, uh, you can kind of see the track that's been worn in here, right? The size of the focal spot or focal track, the width of the focal track or the size of the focal spot, is always smaller than the size or, or length of the filament because of this focusing effect. Roughly speaking, the focal spot on the anode surface is about 5% the size of the filament. So whatever the width of the length of the filament is, the actual area for the focal spot is about a 1 1 1 20th of that size, 5%. So standard x-ray tubes, small focal spots around 0.5 to 0.6 millimeters, half millimeter, large focal spots about 1 to 2 millimeters. This is a square, 
one to two, one milli, say a one millimeter square or a one half millimeter square, a tiny spot that all of the uh, x-rays are originating from. Remember that I, using the analogy of the lights in the room and flashlights, I told you that a smaller focal spot gives you more detail. It's like having a single flashlight, right? Larger focal spots give you less detail, but look how much more light the, the room can put out than my flashlight can, right? So there's advantages to the large focal spot, just not in detail, okay? Small focal spot, great detail, less capacity. Large focal spot, less detail, but more capacity to carry um, electrons. Some machines, so from that you learn that smaller is better for detail, right? If you want extreme detail, then you need to go to extremely small focal spots. So some uh, x-ray tubes done for, uh, used for like angiographic medicine, where they, uh, angiographic radiography, where they're looking at tiny blood vessels, need better detail. So you go to smaller and smaller focal spots. What's the disadvantage to coming to a tiny, tiny focal spot like 0.1 millimeters? Um, you, you can still cover like a, a certain large surface area. Think about what the advantage to the lights in this room versus my single flashlight would be. What's the, what the disadvantage is we lose detail with the lights in the room, right? What was the advantage to having all these lights versus just one flashlight? It's brighter in one area than the room is brighter, right? With all the lights on, right? The room is, is much better lit with all the lights on than with only one tiny flashlight, right? While I would have better detail, with one tiny flashlight of one single object. If I want to look at one single object, I'm going to want a tiny flashlight, right? If I want to look at everyone in the room, I'm going to use all the lights in the room, right? So for um, x-ray production purposes, large focal spots can produce more x-rays, make more light, okay? Small focal spots will produce relatively less x-rays, but give you the added detail in your images, which is either useful or not. You have to choose, right? You can't have both in this case. You have to choose improved detail or better uh, x-ray producing capacity. And there's, you know, in the middle, there's some gray area where you can kind of get both happening, right? Um, but roughly speaking, that's the, that's the idea. Okay. Let's move forward. So we've talked about the cathode end. Um, let's get a quick, let's, see, let's get a quick picture of the whole x-ray tube and then we'll talk about the anode. So here's your x-ray tube. You'll notice that um, you'll see the anode with the anode shank uh, uh, shown in this image. That's one side of the x-ray tube, this side. You'll notice there is a focusing cup and cathode on this uh, negative or right side of the image. We can zoom in on that. So there's our um, functional stuff inside there. We have our spinning disc with an angle to the face of it and a focusing cup and cathode for, for being our source of electrons. The idea is send that cloud of electrons across that gap at some velocity, converting their speed into x-rays when they hit the anode disk. Not shown in this image, a lot of things, but not shown in this image is the stator that would wrap around the anode shank, that would wrap around this part of the anode. Okay, this long part of the anode. So what we'll do in this next image is show you the cartoon picture of it, okay? Showing you that the stator windings would be wrapping around the anode. In this, you should also notice on the side of things, we have the anode shank, the actual rotor shank or the axle, if you want to call it that, supported by ball bearings. The anode disc is made of a dense metal tungsten. This is also made of dense metal all the way through here. These ball bearings are made of dense metal, and we know metal is a conductor, right? So all of this is going to heat up during the exposures. The ball bearings heat up during the exposure, and this is primarily where you get x-ray tube failure at, okay, yeah, are, the, are the bearings. These bearings have to support a, a and it's not, I mean, it weighs something, right? That just weighs something, and it's going to have to spin extremely fast, okay, several thousand RPM. In fact, we might get to this in a moment, this disc spins so fast that if there were no braking system for it, after every exposure, it would be something like 15 to 30 minutes for the uh, disc to stop spinning. I think the book quotes like 20 minutes, right? It would take 20-ish minutes for that disc to stop spinning if we just turned it off and let it freely coast to a stop, okay? We actually have to apply um, 
like a, a motor-like current to it to slow that disc down. That's why your discs stop spinning in about one minute after the exposure. Noise stops about a minute after exposure rather than 20 or 30 minutes after exposure. So there's your rotor shank, your anode disc with the anode face and the, shown the, then the target, the target being the place where the focal spot is. The target is where we direct the electrons to. We have our glass envelope here. This glass is made of Pyrex. What do you guys know about Pyrex? What's it good for? Baking. Baking, right? Why is Pyrex good for baking? It doesn't crack, right? I can put it in an oven at 550 degrees, right? Take it out, and it's not going to crack when I set it on the counter or something like that, right? You guys may know that glass, uh, just regular glassware, like non-Pyrex glassware, right? If you take it out of the oven, scoop out your dinner onto your plates, and then toss it in the sink and turn the cold water on, what happens? It shatters, cracks, blows up, right? Why? Why do glassware break? What does glassware break when it goes from hot to cold? You're on you got the right idea. So when thing I'll give it from a macroscopic perspective. When things are very, very warm, they expand. Okay? When things are very, very cold, they contract, con contract, constrict. Okay? When an object goes from being very hot to very cold very quickly, certain parts of it are going to constrict quicker than other parts of it, okay? So you get parts of a glass pan, some of it constricting, contracting faster than other parts, you're going to get stresses in the glass where it's going to pull apart, it's going to crack, okay? Um, if it's a bendable material, no big deal, right? But glass is not flexible, okay? Parts of that glass are going to constrict faster than other parts when you run it under cold water. Did you have some? I think I cut you off. Do you have some? Uh, yeah. Similar thing? I was going to say that. Perfect. <laughs> you're, on the right, you're on the right idea. So, um, if an x ray tube is heated up and cooled down to. What's up, Barbie? Uh, can I go? Um, yeah. um, if an x ray tube is heated up and, or cooled down too quickly, it's still at risk for that. But the Pyrex makes it way less likely because your Pyrex glass is way better at heating up and cooling down many times and not cracking. Um, and our x-ray tubes have to get heated up and cooled down all day long for their entire serviceable lifespan, 10 years or more maybe, right? Our, our x-ray tube here is from like the, the late 80s, early 90s and has worked this whole time, right? What's so the difference between regular glass and... It's a really good question. Pyrex is a brand name glass. Um, you're going to want to know what's in that, right? I don't know. Whatever's in it, however they've engineered it, it's really good at retaining heat, losing heat without changing its molecular structure very much. Never, never uh, use boiling water when you want to just compress your windows. Yeah, your windshield is just, it's not Pyrex glass, right? It's just regular old glass. It's a good question. I don't know exactly what py how Pyrex glass is different. I know it is different. I don't know what makes it different. That's a good question. But yeah, you see that with your windows too. Um, if you have a small crack in your windshield and then you like go to summertime, right? Your windshields are heating up during the, in, the, in the sun and you run your AC when you get in your car and your windshields cool down, right? These little cracks become big cracks, right? Because the glass is changing its um, shape a little bit, constricting and, and expanding, yeah. and that creates weak spots. That's, okay. that's what happened to me yeah. when it was raining, because that little crack, and then it just got oh, the yeah. baker's shield, and yeah, they get big all of a sudden, right? Um, yeah, I have the same thing. My truck wind, windshield started a small crack, and then slowly from heating up and cooling down over last summer, it went all the way across, right? Along with like the shaking and jiggling of driving the car, too. But the heating and cooling is part of it. This glass envelope has to do the job of sealing off the inside of the x-ray tube from the outside environment, okay? This x-ray tube's glass envelope creates a vacuum on the inside. What's a vacuum? Pressure. No atmosphere pressure. No atmosphere inside here, right? right? So no pressure inside of there. No. And so what is your atmosphere? Your atmosphere is a bunch of molecules of gas, right? Nitrogen, oxygen. Uh, most of it is nitrogen and oxygen. In this room, all these molecules are in a gas form, all bumping into each other, right? And they're all stacked on top of us. And there's a lot of atmosphere above us pushing down on us, right? If you take and seal off a container and suck all the atmosphere out of it like this, then you have no molecules, no gas particles to run into. There's nothing, literally nothing, between here and there for the uh, electrons to run into. 
if there was a crack in this or we just didn't use the glass envelope, those electrons would get from cathode to anode, but on their way, many of them would be absorbed and stopped, just run into the air in the room, okay? So what you can do is you can suck all the air out, right? Earlier ones, when they were first inventing the first called cathode ray or Crookes tubes, um, back in the late 1800s, those actually had a gas in them. They would just put an inert gas into the tube, and the inert gas was kind of like having a vacuum. It was just easier to do than creating a vacuum. Nowadays, all of our x-ray tubes are vacuum sealed. There's nothing inside of here to run into. Uh, so, say if the bearings and the and the device, they do go out, um, it's sealed in there in the glass. You can't remove the glass. Okay, and then, so we just have to re replace the entire part? The whole, that whole thing gets taken out and replaced. Oh, wow. The whole thing, not just the glass tube, right? So yeah, this is non-serviceable, okay? Once this is built, sealed, packaged, it's like having an incandescent light bulb, right? You cannot go inside the light bulb and replace the filament when it gets old. Um, it breaks, it breaks, right? So this is all... What's it? Uh, void the warranty. Yeah, warranties. Void, yes. And they have warranties, and if you mistreat them, that can void warranties on them. You know, so that's why you have a part of why you have like a documented procedure every day when you turn up, turn on, you warm up your equipment. At the end of the day, you shut it down properly. You document all of this, and you take care of it correctly. And if something goes wrong during the serviceable lifespan, then it's covered by warranty. Right? If it's not, then it's not covered by warranty. Um, so you want to make sure when you, you know when we're buying these, that the, the, the companies are buying ones that have good service programs too. That's what makes these expensive. On top of being good equipment, makes you have to have good service programs for them um, because this stuff this stuff is non-serviceable. But as long as you have a warranty, you can replace these things. So yeah, that's that's the deal. Glass envelope all sealed off. Your anode disc spins and serves as the positively charged uh, surface for the electrons to run into. Your cathode side has the filament wires coming in, and you have the di two different filaments to choose from, um, and its job is to create the space charge, the cloud of electrons. So cathode and anode, electrons travel from cathode to anode, hitting the anode, creating photons. Notice right here, they show the glass being a little thinner, okay? It's hard to see. It's actually a, a circular disc shape. Right in that spot, there's a thin area in the glass. It's just thinned out in one spot. Um, anything in the way of an x-ray beam will partially absorb the beam. Lead does a really good job of absorbing the x-ray beam, but glass also can absorb x-rays. Any matter can absorb x-rays, so we want to minimize, we, say it another way, we want to control the amount of x-rays we are absorbing before it gets to the patient, right? We want to know how much we're absorbing, and we probably want to absorb the minimum possible so that we can get more of the beam to the patient and have more usable x-ray beam. So there's a window here. It's not an opening. It's just a thin spot in the glass. Or later on, we'll talk about um, something called x-ray beam filtration. This is a, a form of built-in filtration. It's called inherent filtration. You can't get rid of it. You can have a thin window, but you can't have no window, right? Okay, good. How are you guys feeling about the picture of the x-ray tube so far? And that all corresponds to the actual x-ray tube, which is shown here. And is the window only on one side of the tube? Or yeah. The, so when you put the tube in, it's... It's in directional, right? The window is where the x-ray tube points down towards the table. So you don't lose the x-rays in the top of the... Oh, yeah. X-rays go in all directions. They go in all directions. We want them to go out one direction, so we make the spot that we want them to go out, the part, place that we're actually like Smaller. letting them out from, to be thinner and, and, and have less of attenuation. But x-rays travel in all, all directions. Is, is the window an open space? No, it's just a thin spot in the glass. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thin spot in the glass, right at the bottom of the tube, where x-rays would be directed down towards the table. <laughs> Remember, less than 1% of everything, all the energy put in makes x-rays, right? But that 1% that becomes x-rays, 
all of those x-rays travel equally in all directions. So of that 1%, some small fraction of those actually make it down out of the tube. And of those ones that actually make it down out of the tube, we absorb some of them on purpose because of purposeful filtration, which we'll talk about later. And even the ones that make it past that, we collimate our x-ray beam, right? So there's some teeny tiny fraction of the total energy that goes into this actually comes out to be usable x-rays passing through the patient. It's way less than the 1% we told you because that 1% is traveling all directions from the anode phase, right? Only some of them are going down towards the table surface. Okay, anyways, that's maybe more than we need for right now. Let's, <coughs> let's move on. Let's talk about the uh, 